Good evening. The uh, photograph that you see here is uh, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope probably about 15 years ago. It's called a deep field image because at the time it was the uh, furthest in the space we had ever seen. I guess what you see there is a bunch of stars. It's not just a bunch of stars. Most of the smudges that you see there are not actually stars, they're galaxies. In fact, many of them aren't even galaxies, they're actually globular clusters, they're clusters of galaxies. When you look in the night sky, most of what you see are not stars. Many of what you see are stars within the Milky Way, but many are not. They are galaxies or clusters of galaxies. I want to think about the mathematics of this for a minute. As a scientist, I can't help it. A typical, a typical galaxy like ours has about 100 to 400 billion, billion stars in it. Stars are suns, like our sun. There seems to be in the universe somewhere between 100 and 200 billion galaxies. If you do the math, there's something like 1 times 10 to the 24th stars. That's one with 24 zeros after it. That's trillions of trillions of suns. It turns out where there's suns, there, is usually, there are usually planets. And on at least one planet, there's life. This talk is not about my belief whether there's extraterrestrial life or not, but it's in the awe-inspiring thoughts that come to my mind when I look at a picture like this. In fact, to put the number in context, if you went somehow to every beach on the planet Earth and counted every grain of sand, every grain, every beach, it's about the same number. It's about 1 times 10 to the 24th. Imagine that. That's how many stars there are. Why isn't this at the foundation of our inquiry-based curriculum? Uh, maybe we should build an entire curriculum around these ideas and inspire the next generation of inve inventors, explorers, and problem solvers. It's worked before. But we'll return to space a little bit later. Change. It's here to stay. Always has been. It's a timely topic. Uh, as educators and students face change at a rate that is unparalleled in recent memory. The change I'm most interested in is that which comes internal to the individual. That is something we can control. Change, while sometimes driven by necessity, may also be driven by inspiration. So you ask me to talk about inspiration, I'm going to talk about my inspirations and what's made me the teacher uh, that I am. After graduating from Clarkson University with a degree in mechanical engineering, I went to work for IBM. It was pretty much a dream uh, job for a tech geek, and uh, it began a very successful career. First, I was an engineer. Then I was an engineering supervisor. I became a middle manager. I was on executive resource list. Everything looked great. But something was missing, and the truth is I knew it within my first couple of years of, of uh, working for IBM. But I didn't have the, the desire, the vision, or the direction to really change my circumstance. That began to change when, in my late 20s, I met a beautiful woman named Elise. She's here tonight. And uh, I know I did well, right? And I had hair. That's right. Um, who eventually became my wife. Just over a year later, she gave birth to our first son, Harry Vincent. And my life truly changed everything about it. The moment he was born, I experienced emotions I had no idea that were inside of me. Things changed again a few years later when my second son, James Lorenzo, was born. Following his birth, my ideas about the future changed entirely. You see, for the first six months of James' life, he was the younger one, I really had no relationship with him at all. The first six months or so, he was asleep when I left for work in the morning, he was asleep when I got home at night, um, and I wasn't feeling what I wanted to feel as a dad. My job at IBM required 70 hours of work a week, plus one hour commute each way to Dutchess County where the factory was. Uh, the truth was IBM owned me and had to change. Teaching had always been a secondary interest of mine. Uh, eventually, I was bold enough to inform IBM that I wanted to make a change. I enrolled at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas College, and in less than two years, I was teaching physics and coaching baseball at Clarkstown North, my alma mater. While the pay was a lot less than I was accustomed to, I was about to begin living what I think is a dream. It took me a few years to really figure out why, at its core, teaching attracted, I was attracted to teaching. It turns out I had had an incredible, incredible history of teachers, 
most of them not employed by Clarkstown. The first was my father, Harry. Of the many lessons I learned from him, I'll share two that most inspired my teaching practice. One, the power of firm but caring counseling. He would always find just the right way to get me to know that I was wrong. But I knew he got no joy out of the misdeeds. A famous thing I joked with my sister about um, one time when he told me, I know you aren't doing anything everybody else isn't doing, but you're getting caught, which means you're no good at it, so you better stop doing it. <laughs> that was logic that, um, it's inarguable. He was right. He was right. Uh, second thing was uh, knowing the difference between the appearance of a person and who a person truly is. My dad uh, was catastrophically injured when I was uh, 12, and um, after that his physical reality was uh, very much changed. Uh, and, per and very much changed and, and permanently changed. Uh, but the truth was his character remained as strong as ever. If not, uh, it only grew stronger. See, these lessons aren't from a textbook, folks. They're from a role model. You gotta find one. And then there was my mom. She's here tonight, too. Uh, to this day, I've never met a more energetic and caring person. She's taught me that life is not measured by what you get, but by what you give. She amazes me to this day and inspires me to give everything I'm capable of giving. Another role model for me was my paternal grandfather, Pop. Who are, everybody called him Pop. He's the person most influential in molding my scientific curiosity. Pop only made it through the sixth grade, but he went on to become a, a skilled mechanic and uh, machinist, and he enjoyed nothing more than tinkering with something that was broken. He could focus on the smallest problem for hours, if not for days. And he was in no rush to find the solution. He simply enjoyed the intellectual calisthenics that come with solving a problem. I love that, and I think our students need to embody that. Whether it was making our fishing boat run better or building a closet using only the stuff and know-how we had in the basement, there was just a joy working with Pop. I miss him. My relationship with Pop reminds me a lot about um, the relationship a Nobel Prize winning physicist, my personal favorite physicist, Richard Feynman, enjoyed with his father. Uh, if you would click on that and then scroll to three minutes and 45 seconds, please. This is Feynman talking about the relationship Good. with his dad. You only know let's about go. humans in different places and what they call the bird. Now, he says, let's look at the bird and what it's doing. He had taught me to notice things. And one day when I was playing with what we call an express wagon, which is a little wagon which has a railing around it for children to play with that they can pull around. It had a ball in it. I remember this. It had a ball in it. And I pulled the wagon, and I noticed something about the way the ball moved. So I went to my father, and I said, Say, Pop, I noticed something. When I pull the wagon, the ball rolls to the back of the wagon. It rushes to the back of the wagon. And when I'm pulling along, and I suddenly stop, the ball rolls to the front of the wagon. I said, Why is that? And he said, that, he says, nobody knows. He said, the general principle is that things that are moving try to keep on moving. And things that are standing still tend to stand still unless you push on them hard. And he says, this tendency is called inertia, but nobody knows why it's true. Now, that's a deep understanding. He doesn't give me a name. He knew the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something which I learned very, very early. He went on to say, if you look close, you'll find the ball does not rush to the back of the wagon, but it's the back of the wagon that you're pulling against the ball, that the ball stands still. Well, as a matter of fact, from the friction, starts to move forward, really, and doesn't move back. So I ran back to the little wagon and set the ball up again and pulled the wagon from under it and looking sideways and seeing indeed he was right, the ball never moved backwards in the wagon when I pulled the wagon forward. It moved backward relative to the wagon, but relative to the sidewalk, it was moved forward a little bit. It's just the wagon caught up with it. So that's the way I was educated by my father, with those kind of uh, examples and discussions. No pressure, just lovely, interesting discussion. Mr. Diamond, can you close that, please? So no pressure, just wonderful discussion a focus on deep understandings. Of course, there's many other teachers I'd like to thank. Many of them were Clarkstown teachers, and I had to cut something out of my speech. So, But I will note uh, Mr. Newman, who was my high school physics teacher, and uh, 
showed me projectile motion equations, which made me change my uh, desired career from journalism to uh, engineering. Uh, coach Buntrager, my varsity baseball coach, uh, and also Coach Jack Phillips, who was my college baseball coach, who showed me that while times change, uh, acting with class never goes out of style. In my early adulthood, I also sometimes chose baseball players to be role models to some extent. One example is Gary the Kid Carter. He was a catcher on the last Met team to win the World Series in 1986. He was a heck of a player, but it, it was his leadership skills and his infectious smile that made him a favorite of mine. It's funny, but sometimes you don't know how much a person influences you, I think as Mr. L and some others said, until uh, much later in life. I, I guess we call that maturity. Carter died last year after a long battle, battle with cancer, and uh, I was saddened by his passing more so than any other person who died that I didn't know. It was kind of weird. Um, but it, it made me think a little more about uh, some of the educational reform and, and the effect we have on students. Um, how do we measure, how can we possibly measure the impact a teacher has on students years after the classroom experience has ended? In my opinion, this is the true measure of teacher excellence. It's the one I'm most interested in. But it's not an element of any of the, the uh, measurement systems that are being put into place, at least none that I'm aware of. I don't contend to know how to measure that. Uh, I'm sure it's very difficult to do, but just because it's difficult is no reason not to try. Which gets me back to the role space has in inspiring our young people. Man landed on the moon famously, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. It makes me wonder about our space program and its impact on young minds. Seven or eight years ago, uh, I was not a, uh, a space enthusiast. I, I am now, but I wasn't then. And uh, I looked in the newspaper, and I saw that the Rockland Astronomy Club was having a viewing party at RCC in a parking lot. Uh, my son, Harry, was about five years old, and I wanted to expose him to something new. So uh, it was February. I remember it was, it was winter. It was brutal. Um, I decided that Friday we were going to go and, and go uh, observe something uh, through a telescope. So uh, on that Friday we got bundled up. It was unimaginably cold and we show up at uh, RCC. We pull in the parking lot and there's no party going on. There's like two cars way in the corner and something I think that might be a telescope. So I drive over there and I say to the guy, uh, is this the viewing party? He said, no, oh, you know, it was canceled. but..." I couldn't stand having anybody show up and not get to look through a telescope, so I came anyway. I don't know who that guy was, but I really do owe him a debt of gratitude. Um, so Harry and I jump out of the car, and he, uh, I look through the telescope first. He has it fixed on the ringed planet Saturn. And I look through it first. I was in awe of what I saw. And my son Harry looks second. He says, Dad, it looks like a cartoon. It almost looks beyond belief. When I see things like that, that's the role, that's inspiration to me. Suddenly Saturn wasn't a picture in a book. It was a place. It was as real as the earth beneath our feet. Before long I was reading everything I could about the cosmos and I bought myself a telescope. Astronomy is now another passion of mine. It enriches my life. It indeed inspires me, like baseball and some of the other things we talked about. Back in 1970, Arthur Clarke said, the inspirational value of the space program is probably of far greater importance to education than any input of dollars. Remember, this is after man walked on the moon. This is after the Apollo uh, missions. A whole, Clark goes on to say, a whole generation is growing up which has been attracted to the hard disciplines of science and engineering by the romance of space. I can't help but wonder if we invested all the money targeted for educational reform into the space program. Instead, what might be the outcome? Perhaps young people inspired by a different vision of the future, an entirely different, unimagined vision of the future, something that stirs inside of them. You see, excellence in almost any field, students, comes from inside the individual. I know one of our earlier speakers um, already covered this quote, but it is so true. Education, to me, is lighting a fire. It's not filling a bucket. Um, or a pail, I beg your pardon. To me, my sense is it is what the teacher is, not the content that's taught that makes the biggest difference. The people who influ influenced me the most, it was who they were. Albert Einstein once cautioned us, everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. 
This seems especially germane in today's education reform environment. Some efforts are to be commended, I feel. The Common Core Standards, the Next Generation Science Standards, the Park Exam are, are most notable. But I personally remain skeptical that we'll address the issues we wish to address by instituting, instituting more rules, regulations, and standards. After all, how do we really measure inspiration? And what is success for the student? What is success for the teacher? I prefer to think of success in the terms that the great UCLA basketball coach John Wooden defined it. He said, success is peace of mind which is the direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become the best you are capable of becoming. I like this definition so much because it is so personal and individualized and has an internal locus. In other words, you are the only person who can truly assess your level of success. And I can't leave without saying if, I'm need of, if I am in need of any additional inspiration these days, I need to know, look no further than my own sister, Renee. She's here. Uh, she's done many amazing things in her life, but I've got to share this one. Her most recent challenge is to participate in a Spartan race this Sunday. I don't know if you're familiar with the Spartan race. It is not for wussies. She's been training, most, uh, she's been training like mad for months. I know she's ready to go. She's 42 years old, she's still younger than me. It'll be her first attempt at the race. She's in the best shape of her life. I think she would benefit for our, from our support. How about a hand for Renee, huh? All right. Thank you, you're, a, uh, you're an amazing sister and you inspire me to be a better person. Thank you all very much.